There's no real difference between the two rotor systems at all. Blade inertia is independent of the number of blades. There are examples of high inertia and low inertia in both semi-rigid and articulated systems. The problem with flying in the mountains is there are very few landing areas. Therefore, I recommend flying at much higher altitudes to increase the availability of available landing areas. We have three variables here, wind, weight, and density altitude. A good rule of thumb is 1.5 times the rotor diameter and then adjust from there. I'm not sure how many times I've scraped the tail skid in an auto rotation. It has happened. Remember that the purpose of that tail skid is to warn the pilot of a tail low attitude. Develop a feel for the proper attitude through practice and training with a flight instructor. Best tip I have is don't do it. Practice auto should have a flight instructor on board. They can prevent bad habits from forming and they're trained to recover from deteriorating or bad auto rotations. Auto rotation training should begin in the pre-solo stage of training and then be conducted throughout the entire private pilot course. For example, our private pilot syllabus at Robinson introduces auto rotations in hour 10. Our regulations in the U.S. require auto rotations be introduced prior to solo. It's not really a question of which control is moved first. Rather, it's the configuration that the aircraft is in. For example, in this R44, the correct configuration is 90 knots and 90% rotor RPM. There are two variables. First is wind and weight that will affect the maximum glide distance. This varies depending on density altitude, angle of attack, and blade speed. But all of our POHs say you should never allow the RPM to get below 80% plus 1% per 1,000 feet of density altitude. For training, Robinson recommends a minimum of 90%. Above 108% in an R66 will be a rotor overspeed. High RPMs will increase the descent rate in auto rotations, and overspeeds may result in burnelling in the spindle bearings. Due to the inherent lag in the turbine engine, begin the power recovery just before the flare. Open the throttle full open. Think of it as flipping a switch and then immediately raise the collective about one inch to prevent an N2 overspeed. Halfway through the flare, the engine will be spooling up and now would be the time to slowly begin to raise the collective to terminate at a hover. In the R22 or the R44, Enter the auto rotation by smoothly and slowly lowering the collective full down, simultaneously a little aft cyclic and right pedal. Once the collective is full down, retard the throttle to split the needles. In the R66, it's a little different. To prevent an N2 overspeed, we're going to begin by rolling the throttle off, then lowering the collective full down, simultaneously applying aft cyclic and right pedal. Absolutely not true at all. In fact, I think it's absolutely crazy to even try. Yes, it's possible to go backwards in the auto rotation, but it's not recommended. The backwards part is easy. The transition to forward flight is the tricky part. 
because a high sink rate will be developed that requires a high degree of pilot skill to dissipate. I would only consider going backwards into a very strong headwind, 25, 30 knots, where a 360 degree turn might be very difficult. I don't know the exact numbers here. I do know that the helicopter community has crashed far too many helicopters practicing for an event that rarely occurs. However, engines can and do quit, so we do have to train for it.